as COVID vaccinations are expected to become mandatory for staff in care homes, will the government extend that move to all NHS staff? Well, to talk about that and also uh, the Australia deal, we are joined now by the Trade Secretary, Liz Truss. Very good morning, morning. to you. Um, we know that the government's set to announce uh, mandatory jabs for care home staff, but I wonder whether they've done any sort of risk assessment on how many staff might just go, well, OK, then, I'll just leave the sector, because that would be devastating for care homes. Well, I'm sure these, uh, these issues have been looked into, uh, and that's why the government's held a consultation, and we are shortly, as you rightly say, about to announce the results of that consultation. What's important, though, is we have some very, very vulnerable residents in our care homes across the country, and it is very important that staff are vaccinated and we prevent the spread of COVID-19. You know, we're making huge progress on our vaccination programme. Uh, we want to make sure that all the over 40s have a double jab before the 19th of July, and particularly with care homes, particularly because of the vulnerable nature of the people in care homes, we do need to make sure that staff have those jabs. The fact of the matter is that the vulnerable in the care homes have by and large been vaccinated. It seems that the bigger risk might be that you lose the very special skills of those looking after them. Because if you fail to persuade staff to have the vaccine, you could just lose people who are looking after those vulnerable residents. But it is in people's interest to have the vaccine. Uh, it helps keep you safe and it helps to keep your friends and family safe and it helps to keep us safe as a country. So there is every reason for people to take the vaccine and I strongly encourage them to do so. But of course, these are exactly the types of issues the government has been weighing up uh, in the consultation. And I can't prejudge, I'm afraid, uh, the announcement we're going to make. But but. Rest assured, we are very keen right. to make sure that care home workers do have those vaccinations. We are expecting that what you're going to say, and I know you won't confirm this, but it's, it's been widely reported this morning, that you're going to give these people 16 weeks. If they won't have the jab straight away, you'll give them 16 weeks to make their minds up. And if they don't have the jab after 16 weeks, they're out. That's that. And they wouldn't be hired if they were coming into the job if they, if they weren't vaccinated. Um, is there a halfway house? If you've got a very, very skilled care worker who won't have the jab for whatever reason, could you not possibly have an, uh, an exemption where they were tested every three days, say? twice a week, something like that? Well, it's, it's difficult, of course, for me to talk about the results of the response to the consultation before we've announced it, Richard. You'll appreciate that. But, of course, we want to be pragmatic. We want to work with care homes and care home staff to get the best possible results. This is all about protecting lives. It's all about trying to make sure that we deal with COVID and we make sure the most vulnerable are protected. And so, what about, rolling rolling it out, and what about rolling it out into the wider NHS? Now, that's being heavily speculated on this morning. If you do do this, if you do announce this uh, in a few days' time, do you think that will be the precursor to a much wider extension of the programme? Well, let's wait to see what the announcement is later this week. Uh, this is obviously particularly critical because of the vulnerable nature of people in care homes. And you've rightly, Richard, stated some of the you know, the, the pros and cons and some of the concerns that might be about adopting this sort of practice more widely. And, of course, that is what we need to weigh up. I mean, throughout the COVID crisis, we have had to weigh up uh, unpalatable options in order to make sure lives are protected, and we'll, we'll continue to do that. OK, let's move from um, vaccines to the Australia deal. Um, now, the deal is... Ex oh, congratulations, by the way. Yes, well we, we do love a good trade deal. <laughs> um, the value of the deal is expected to increase UK GDP over 15 years by 0.01 to 0.02%. I mean, just in comparison, your own estimates uh, of leaving the EU single market reduces the UK GDP by four whole percent. Um, it's good to have a trade deal but it really is a drop in the ocean of what we're losing, isn't it? Well, the, the numbers that you've just talked about, that's a static analysis of the world as it is now. What we are seeing is a huge rise in trade with the Asia-Pacific market. 
And Australia is important in itself. We're likely to see a 30% increase in trade with Australia by 2030. And what we've got in this deal is tariffs removed on products like cars, on whiskey, much better access for Brits to go and live and work in Australia, including three years for the under 35s. But it's also a stepping stone to the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is a major deal with 11 countries in the Pacific region, population of 500 million. And what we're seeing is that is a very fast-growing part of the world, okay. where there is huge demand do, for British yeah. goods. So this is, this is part of a broader trade strategy, which is opening Britain up, opening up yeah. opportunities for Britain to the wider world. You know, we've been in the EU, we've been behind a protectionist wall yeah. for 50 years, we are now opening up those massive opportunities okay. for British business. And, lots you know, the analysis you quote... opportunities, but can I just... A lot of people here, particularly farmers, very worried about the fact it might close down opportunities for our own domestic farmers. The National Farmers Union says Australian farmers are able to produce beef at a lower cost of production and could undercut farmers. Here, the UK Trade and Business Commission is worried Australian farming operates on a scale that we simply can't compete with. Australia contains eight of the largest farms in the world, including a farm which is larger than the country of Israel. I mean, how are our own farmers going to compete with those low-cost imports? Well, we have very high-quality lamb and beef produced in this country, and what we're doing is we're opening up new opportunities. So... We're now shipping our beef to the US for the first time in 24 years. We're seeing rising trade with Asia as the growing middle class there is demanding high quality, high welfare products, which Britain produces. So this is about opening up opportunities for farmers in that wider Asia Pacific region. But I, I would point out in terms of the... Are you saying that the National Farmers Union doesn't know what it's talking about? I'm saying the National Farmers Union does need to look at the opportunities in the future and where the future growth is in the demand for these products. Because most of Australian beef and lamb goes into the Asia-Pacific market where prices are higher. And at the moment, we've already got a tariff-free quota-free deal with the EU. We're importing 230,000 tonnes of beef from the EU every year. What we're talking about here is giving Australia the same terms as the EU in 15 years' time. Okay, okay. So that is a very long period of adjustment. And in the meantime, we need to make sure that our products are reaching those wider markets, which is where the opportunities are. All right. Now, just briefly, uh, to change the subject, uh, Jacob rees the leader of the House, um, has said in his blog that he basically thinks that this extension to the lockdown past the 21st of June is a big mistake, and society is paying far too high a price for um, a, a tiny, tiny margin of extra safety. Um, he's a leader of the House. You got a problem? I don't think that's a direct quote that you've just given me no, there. It's a from, it's a from, uh, yeah, it's a <laughs> slightly uh, uh, embellished summary, if you don't, if you don't mind my saying. I mean, look, none of us, as freedom-loving people, like the fact that we have had to put these restrictions in place. But we've been talking earlier about the very vulnerable people in society. That we do need to continue with the vaccine rollout. We need to make sure that those over forties have a double vaccination and that is why the prime minister is taking a cautious approach and i'm sure your viewers uh, and certainly the people i've spoken to across the country support the prime minister's approach in being cautious of course nobody likes it of course uh, we want to have those opportunities to 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 go out and to be able to do things in the way we want to do them but what we can't have is a situation where we go into reverse on dealing dealing with COVID. So, uh, you know, I, I understand what uh, Jacob is saying, but fundamentally we need to be cautious and get this thing lifted on July the 19th. Thanks very much indeed. I wasn't really embellishing what he said. I was just putting it in the kind of English that we speak because he doesn't speak the same kind of English as the rest of us. Um... <laughs> Liz Trust, thanks very much indeed. <laughs> Thank you.